I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law and Director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States at Chicago Kent College of Law. I'm here with my colleague. Do you introduce yourself? Uh, I am Professor Joan Steinman here at Chicago Kent. So we're here today to talk about two of the more uh, technical aspects of the same-sex marriage cases that are before the Supreme Court. Um, both of these cases, in both of these cases, the lower courts found the laws in question unconstitutional. And of course, the Supreme Court is being asked to decide if they were right. But there's some possibility that the Supreme Court won't get there. Uh, it doesn't, in fact, have the power, or as we lawyers like to say, jurisdiction, to do so. And so I'm hoping that you can help explain what that means. Well, the federal courts in this country have jurisdiction that's limited by the Constitution. And Article Three of the Constitution uh, extends the judicial power of the United States to cases and controversies, cases that arise under federal law and controversies involving the United States. Uh, that term, case or controversy, in turn has different elements, including a notion that the people who sue and the people who appeal have to have what's called standing. The idea being not just anybody should be able to sue, uh, not just anybody should be able to appeal a decision they think is wrong. And so uh, by law, by judge-made law, we limit the people who can appeal to people who have been injured by the judgment below uh, and, and to situations where the higher court can redress their injury. And in these cases, uh, there's some question whether the people who are appealing or the entities that are appealing have that necessary standing. And the reason for that has to do with something that kind of unusual that happened in these cases. In both Perry and uh, Windsor, the person, the entity that would normally defend these statutes declined to do so. Can, can you explain that? Yes. Uh, in Windsor, uh, the Department of Justice, which represents the executive branch of the government. And here we're talking about the United States. Yes, the United States government, took the position that while it would enforce DOMA, uh, it would, when the issue went to court, it would tell the truth about its position on the unconstitutionality of Section 3 of DOMA, and its position is that Section 3 is and should be held unconstitutional. As a result, it agreed with the plaintiffs. And the same thing as more or less happened in the Perry case, where in that case the California governor and attorney general declined to defend the Proposition 8, the, the, the initiative in question. That's right. They formally admitted the unconstitutionality of Proposition 8. So the United States nonetheless has asked the Supreme Court to consider this with the Windsor case. Why did it do that? Well, it did that primarily because uh, the United States wants an authoritative decision from the Supreme Court. The executive thinks it's unconstitutional. There's a split in points of view among legislators as to whether it's unconstitutional, and the United States has taken the position that it will pay the refund of estate taxes uh, to Ms. Windsor that she is seeking, uh, if but only if the Supreme Court says the, the law is unconstitutional. So that's one way that there might be standing, that there's this dispute over this, this money, several hundred thousand dollars, that the, the United States government is not going to pay Ms. Windsor unless the Supreme Court so rules. That's, that's right. The, the, uh, the federal government, first of all, in order to try to formally create a controversy, did move to dismiss the case in DOMA on the ground that it didn't state a claim the plaintiff wasn't entitled to win. And so, uh, you know, it was kind of taking positions somewhat in tension with one another. On the one hand, moving to dismiss, but on the other hand, when push came to shove, saying, we think the law is unconstitutional. So there is this formal 
adversariness. So even though the executive chose not to defend these laws in the lower courts, there were people who stepped forward and said, we care about defending these laws and we'd like to take on that obligation. Uh, in California, it was some of the proponents of Proposition 8. And in Windsor, it was three members of Congress. Did they, now, and all of, both of those groups of people now are also trying to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that sounds like a controversy. On the one side, we have people who think the law is const laws are constitutional and are so arguing, and on the other side, we have the plaintiffs and, and the executive of these two uh, government entities. Why, why isn't that necessarily good enough? Well, I mean, you're, you're right that there is true adversariness between uh, BLAG, this congressional group, the uh, bipartisan legal advisory group yes, made, made up of right. three members of the House of Representatives. Yes, three members of the leadership of the House of Representatives. So there is adversariness. Their position is that DOMA is absolutely constitutional. Similarly, uh, in, in Perry, uh, proponents of Proposition 8 were permitted to do what's called intervene and come into the case to defend the Constitution. That was at the level of the trial court. Right, that was at the level of the trial court. So they have been involved in the case as it has gone from the trial court to intermediate courts of appeals and now to the Supreme Court. The problem is there are very significant questions about whether either of these uh, individuals have standing to appeal. Why would that be? They, they've, they've certainly invested time and effort. The proponents invested time and effort actually in passing Proposition 8. Why, why wouldn't they have standing? Well, if we, start, if we start with the proponents in California. So normally it would be the executive branch the in, Cal in California that would have both the duty and the right to defend the constitutionality of California laws. It's the executive that has the obligation to enforce the law, and with that comes uh, the right to defend the constitutionality. Uh, these proponents are not the executive. These proponents have not, uh, don't have an interest in themselves personally that would uh, give them standing. Just like people in general don't have, unless they are personally harmed, don't have the standing to go forward and say, I think this law is unconstitutional. That, that's right. So th in and of themselves, the interest in having the law enforced is not an interest they would be recognized to have the right to pursue. They, however, have the advantage uh, that the, the Federal Court of Appeals certified a question to the California Supreme Court asking the California Supreme Court whether under California law these proponents uh, of the initiative would be entitled to represent the state when the state officials who normally would do that have chosen not to. And the state of California, uh, that is, I'm sorry, the California Supreme Court answered that question yes. So it's possible because the California, under state law, they're recognized as having an interest, it's possible that the Supreme Court will say that's good enough for standing. That's right. It is possible the Supreme Court will say that. And the Supreme Court does usually defer uh, to the Supreme Court of a state when it holds something as a matter of state law. The rub is that this is not about whether these proponents would have standing in California court. This is about whether they have standing in federal court. And that's governed by Article Three, so that what California said does not necessarily determine that there, uh, that there would be standing for these private individuals who have no formal governmental authority or responsibilities. So let's talk now about the members of yes. Congress. Why might they not have standing? Okay. They might not have standing because, first of all, 
not even Congress uh, is recognized to have authority to um, enforce the laws. That's not a legislative function, it's an executive function. So Congress itself can't file a lawsuit and say, we want this law enforced. That's right. And in this case, it's not even Congress who's trying to defend the law. Uh, it's not even one full chamber of, Cong uh, of Congress, the House of Representatives. It's three people, uh, the Republicans, who are among the House leadership and have designated this committee uh, to defend the law. There is no precedent for allowing such a subgroup uh, so that even if Congress could do, uh, seek to defend the law as constitutional, and there's very real question about whether it could, this isn't Congress. This is a, just a small committee of the House of Representatives. Well, thank you very much, Joan. Thank you, Carolyn.